Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Adriana Macduff didn't remember her mother, nor could she. After all, her mother was gone when she gave birth to Adriana. Her father, Rick Macduff, was then the deputy director of a factory that produced batteries and accumulators. It was a responsible position, so he simply could not afford to indulge in sad thoughts or even worse to drink. After all, Rick was to raise a daughter in the beginning grief-stricken widower, who, according to relatives, loved and wife Kathy, without memory withdrew into himself. And when he slightly withdrew from grief with his head, went to work. As a result, Rick took the chair of the director of the plant, who retired a year after the sad event. And three years later, the plant was closed. Fortunately, Macduff still had some savings, so he and his four-year-old daughter did not face starvation. But money, as we know, has a way of running out. And the most frustrating thing is that it happens much faster than one can assume. So it was not worth delaying the search for a job. However, he had no luck with jobs. Macduff was ready to work as anything, even as a loader. But employers, apparently, were afraid that he would start sticking his nose in everywhere pointing out the faults of his superiors, and as a consequence, marking him for top positions. Meanwhile, money was running out. One day, when Rick came home, tired, hungry, and angry, after another rejection, he received a call from an old college buddy, Sam. How's it going? The classmate inquired. How are things with a sigh? Macduff interrogated. Yes, as Robert was. Did they close the plant? Yeah, I heard. That's why I'm calling, to be honest. What's going on with your job? Nothing. The bosses are afraid I'll sit them out. I don't see any other reason not to, but I guess you'll be interested in my offer. What offer? Me, Rick, open your own business, said Sam. And such a competent partner. Competent in what? Asked Rick. What do you mean, competent in what? Morrison snorted. In the one that you and I have been studying for five years, I need a good engineer, Macduff stretched out. And what kind of business is a car service? No, it's an audio video and appliance repair firm. I'm offering to take a stake. Interesting. I'm interested, it's interesting, but you have to invest in the business. And I, as you know, I'm broke. Don't even worry about it cheerfully, said Sam. I have enough money for everything I need for the first time. Well, you'll make money and you'll buy your share. So Murphy thought, I was having a hard time finding a job. So there wasn't much choice. In fact, there wasn't one. But business is a risky business. It could pay for itself. But I didn't want to have to take off my last pants to pay off my debts. Besides, Macduff had heard many stories about friends who started a business together and then parted as best enemies, and the fact that Sam had always been a man of action and his conscience was fine. Not an argument. In business, as you know, there are no friends. Anyway, no matter how it was done, the risk of being broke was high, especially at 90. The conversation with the competitors was short, and the players were not slumbering. For these comrades, a new company is like a new portion of fall for vultures. It wasn't. Rick thought. No risk, no risk, no champagne. And he said yes. Well done. Morrison was happy. You won't regret it. We've made such a deal with you. Mom, don't be sad. We'll show everyone the Cuskin's mother. Suddenly Macduff was infected by his classmate's enthusiasm. Absolutely. Here's the story. Friends agreed to meet the next day in a cafe, which was in the center of the city. Rick looked at his watch and went to the kitchen for a snack. In an hour it was necessary to go to kindergarten sunny, so it was worth hurrying. A daughter sees God. Rick was trying to be a good father. Anyway, as far as the material side of rebellion was concerned, there were lots of nice clothes, toys, colorful books, in short, anything that would delight a little girl. Adriana Macduff had everything but one thing a mother's love. Unfortunately, her perpetually busy father couldn't give it either. Rick never refused to nurse in the childhood joys of chocolate, chocolate, 
chocolate, cake, no problem. He's a doll. Yes, please. And even when Rick's financial situation left a lot to be desired due to job loss, he managed to scrounge up the money to buy his daughter extra ice cream. Macduff took care of his daughter as best he could, but he couldn't give the girl just one caress. My princess proudly said Macduff proudly while showing off to friends. Photo by Adriana. However, he never once called the baby princess and in the eyes never once came, said not kissed, and not at all because she did not love. It is fair to say that he behaved with restraint with everyone, with his parents, friends, and even his late wife, whom he adored. Macduff preferred to prove his love, not as he put it verbiage, but deeds. That's exactly what Rick had told his mother when she chastised him for his lack of affection for Adriana. Yes, but a child is a child. It needs not only love but tenderness, the mother had remarked. Cindy, of course, remembered how she had hugged and kissed Rick when she visited him at the pioneer camp. He would blush and hurriedly pull away. Of course, many boys are embarrassed when their mothers kiss and hug them in public. However, Cindy could physically feel her son's discomfort. Rick tensed to the point of a compressed spring and trembled. It was something of a phobia. Did it never really wear off? I understand, but they don't. I hope it'll pass with time. Maybe it was because I wanted a son. The widower pondered, but nonsense. It would have been easier with a boy. That's true. But to love a child less just because it's a girl. That's wild. Some of the relatives were convinced. Rick thought the baby was responsible for her mother's death. Adriana reminded him of his late wife in one way or another. Murphy noted this argument with indignation. Being a man of judgment, he considered nothing of the sort. Thinking, Rick came to the conclusion that he was just shy of expressing his love for his daughter, as, indeed, for everyone he cared for. When Rick came to pick up Adriana at the kindergarten, the girl would run to her father and exclaim joyfully. Daddy Macduff would hug the girl awkwardly as it were and lightly, patting her on the back would say, but she went home. On the way home, the father bought Adriana, something tasty. If she wanted to, he'd take her to the amusement park to ride the merry-go-round. The little girl had a favorite pony pink with a white mane and trusting with blue eyes, with bumbling and eyelashes. In case anyone didn't get it, we're talking about the carousel pony. Adriana didn't want to ride any other papa. What if her pink favorite was busy? Adriana would pout her pink lips and stare at the boy or girl being ridden. At him with an unkind look, the little girl called her friend a frog. The cameraman always asked Adriana with a smile. Swore. Yes, it's important. The girl answered. Father and daughter walked out of the daycare center and Rick asked well home. Or to the park. Well, swore so clerked. Agreed. To the great joy of freedom allies. Hi. She said cheerfully, how are you? And then she answered with a different voice. Hi, I'm good. Adriana told her father she wanted to go home. How's life? How's your daughter? Inquired Sam, after the men exchanged handshakes. You doing okay? Rick answered quite well. Well, God willing, anyway. Rick, here's the concept. While discussing the details of the business, Macduff caught himself getting carried away. Maybe we could really make something work, I thought. The risk turned out to be more than worth it. Rick had paid Sam his half in a year and could now call himself a full partner with a clear conscience. The business brought a stable small profit in the beginning and then quite a decent one, which the partners shared in half. There was a catastrophic lack of time at the dacha. Macduff would take Adriana to kindergarten in the morning, and his mother and sometimes his former mother-in-law would pick the girl up. When Rick came home from work, his daughter was already asleep. You should get married, sighed Cindy, Rick's mother. Mary repeated thoughtfully, yes, Mary. Adriana needs a mother. Women's education is something you have to understand. What about you and Kelly? And who knows how long we have left? Will we make it to her transition age? That's the question. And at that time, 
A girl needs a mother just as much as she needs a mother now. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. But I haven't met someone I want to spend the rest of my life with, and Adriana, so she won't hurt me. They're all about the money. I used to be able to spot them like that. Macduff grinned, remembering when we attacked him when he was the director of the factory. But when the plant closed, there were fewer people who wanted to be associated with Rick. What's less? I thought with a chuckle. They all evaporated at once. And when Macduff became a businessman, the ladies here again. No, he doesn't want that kind of happiness. For money, not dough. Cindy agreed. But don't despair. Your wife will turn up. Yes, I, and do not despair, shrugged Rick. Frankly speaking, Macduff and did not think about marriage. Though, of course, it would be nice for a good woman to bear him a son and hair to whom he could pass the business. Of course, Rick had a daughter, but in his opinion, women had nothing to do in business. Macduff had known many businesswomen, but none of them had inspired him with sympathy. All of them were cold and arrogant, and despite their expensive hairdos and brand name clothes, not at all feminine, she wanted his daughter to be one of them. No way. So there's no way around it without being burned, as the mother put it. The business of former classmates developed surprisingly dynamically and for seven years has suffered a lot of changes. Now Rick and Sam were engaged not only in repair, but also the sale of equipment. The firm sold it to stores, and in the future it was planned to open its own store. And we, when we go to the park, ended Adriana at breakfast. When I have free time, and when will it be? That's what I don't know, Macduff invariably replied. So, seven years, it was only at breakfast that they saw each other. The rest of the time the girl spent with her grandmothers. Daddy doesn't want to go out with me. I have to go out. Adriana would go to one grandmother or the other. When business was booming, both elderly women hastily explained to her granddaughter that her father is very busy. Bolov of himself felt guilty in front of his daughter. But business is business, business he does not wait. Besides, Rick worked tirelessly for his daughter, but Adriana will be everything for the sake of it. As he thought, you can and be patient. But the young Macduff Harris was not willing to be patient and no argument worked on her. If he had talked to Lisa on heart and kindly explained that he did not have enough time to communicate with her, she would have understood everything correctly. And since Rick was being restrained, he couldn't get through to his daughter. Dad, where are you going? Asked Adriana yawning. I'm going to work. What are you doing up? It's Sunday, noted her daughter. And business doesn't care what day of the week it is. Businessmen don't have weekends or holidays. Anyway, I can't afford five businesses yet, said Adriana. Yes, business again, nodded her father. To his credit, he never raised his voice at his daughter. Macduff showed restraint in everything and he's feeding us, by the way. Smart, bright beyond her years, Adriana understood everything except one thing. Her father wanted her to have nothing. As if we were starving, muttered the girl and defiantly turned away Adriana. She didn't want her father to see her tears. She was. You understood perfectly well, but you didn't show it. But he didn't know how to show his feelings openly, as if it were a sin. Then Macduff fell hard in love and was forced to be torn between his daughter and the woman he loved. She became a young saleswoman from the store in which he and Sam put the technique. Every day Rick became more and more convinced that Slaga is the woman with whom he would like to live the rest of his life. She was the only woman Macduff saw as the mother of his son. But how would Adriana feel about that? I spend so little time with her, he told his mother. I don't know how to tell Adriana that I want to marry Clara. Do you want to marry Clara? She exclaimed in surprise. Rick looked furtively at Lisa. The former mother-in-law was a frequent guest at Cindy's house. But Rick, because of the lack of time, did not often visit his mother. So there was little opportunity to talk to her alone. Why are you looking at me like that? Lisa asked with a slight chuckle. You're a young man. You need a wife. That's right. Life goes on. 
Kathy, you can't bring her memory back. Thank you, Lisa, Rick said quietly. It really meant a lot to me to hear that. She was embarrassed. The important thing is that your wife doesn't hurt Adriana. You don't have to worry about that either. Cindy said. She gave her son a fake, menacing look. She will. He'll have to deal with me. All three of them laughed. I don't even doubt that. But the way I see it, we have Adriana and me. So you really want to get married? Mother asked. Well, yes, I do. But let's invite your fiancé to visit, suggested Cindy. How about it? We'll set the table, and you can introduce her. Lisa, how would you feel about that? Well, it's your business. Lisa replied with a sigh. There's a new person coming into your family. Aya, aren't you a member of our family? I interrupted her with mine, shaking my head. Well, well, well. First of all, you're Adriana's grandmother, like me, and the rest is nothing. It's true, Lisa. We are a family, and we will remain one. My new marriage doesn't change anything, Rick said. Thank you, she smiled, and the older woman's eyes settled. You're welcome. Cindy playfully leaned in. Well, how about a banquet? No question about it. Adriana Macduff was increasingly beginning to wonder if Daddy loved me. Her relationship with her father wasn't bad, but it wasn't warm either. Adriana grew up knowing nothing was off limits. Her father bought her beautiful clothes, filled her with toys, took her to the amusement park, circus and other places that children love. Except that the tenderness of the girl did not see when Adriana authorities, troops, father, he awkwardly patted his daughter on the back and said, well, I'm tired. Well, or something like that. When Adriana turned 11 to the girl, it occurred to her that her father considered her guilty for the death of his beloved wife. She had heard more than once from relatives and neighbors that daddy loved his wife beyond memory. So maybe that was it. Mom's gone, but she is. Adriana and the father deep down regret that the wife is dead and the daughter is alive. Don't talk nonsense. Cindy cut her off when her granddaughter shared her thoughts. Who told you such nonsense? No one. Adriana answered with a shrug. Her grandmother looked at her incredulously, but the girl said yes. Really? No one. I thought of it myself. What made you think of such a bright idea? Daddy loves you. He just doesn't show it. Adriana sighed. Cindy sighed too. What's true? Really? Yes, she was aware of her son's temper, but she still hoped he would be able to break himself. Cindy had told Rick more than once to be gentle with her daughter. But what should you hug and kiss a girl and tell her how much you love her? Reprimanded breaking. However, Cindy knew otherwise Rick preferred to prove love with his body and all sorts of tenderness, in his opinion, meant nothing. And even though her son didn't know how to show his feelings, that didn't mean Rick Macduff couldn't love. He did, and he did love. Yes, my little birdie, nodded Cindy. It doesn't show. Well, not showing doesn't mean he doesn't love. My wicked one understands my woe. I do, answered my granddaughter. From this day on, Adriana has set herself the task of arousing strong feelings in you. It's better to make the people feel good. At least she'll know her father cares. But a year passed, and Adriana's attempts to rouse her father never succeeded. One day, when Dad came home from work, he smelled of women's perfume. Adriana knew exactly what that meant and panicked. If Daddy got married, oh God, what would happen then? She'd read fairy tales about evil stepmothers, but she didn't take them seriously. That is, until Molly's father sent her abroad. Her stepmother is a bitch, whispered her friend and classmate Miranda. She had persuaded Molly's father to send her to a boarding house in Switzerland. And Lena could be trusted because she lived in the neighboring cottage. But that the same thing awaits me. With horror thought Adriana, we could only hope that it would not come to the wedding. However, we're having guests tonight, tomorrow night, I want you to meet a very nice woman. With a frugal smile, said the father with the woman, frowned the daughter. With the woman confirmed Macduff. 
nodded Adriana. And what kind of woman? Well, how can I tell you? A very nice woman. You'll find out, Slaga. You'll like it. So, Clara. Adriana said thoughtfully. Yes, she wanted to say something else, but changed her mind. I'll still have time, smiling at her thoughts, fought the businessman's Harris. The chosen one was a blonde with perfectly straight hair, plump lips, and unbelievably blue eyes. Abram Long Eyelashes Abazami. The lady was dressed in a white cropped fur coat, under which was an extremely short pink dress. Like a Barbie doll. Clara. Stephen stretched out her hand with long pink nails decorated with bears and rhinestones. Adriana smiled radiantly at her potential stepdaughter. Do you like glamour? I love it. She smiled broadly in return. Do you? Well, pretty much, yes. Adriana giggled. Cindy came out of the kitchen and invited everyone to the table. Really, why are we standing in the aisle? I'm starving. Adriana noticed the disapproving look Cindy's grandmother gave her possible daughter-in-law. And that gave her hope. When everyone was seated at the table, Rick asked for a moment, attention. Mama Adriana, Lisa, I'd like to introduce you to my favorite woman. This is Clara. A little embarrassed, he said. How long have you been asleep? The daughter asked in a business-like manner. Rick choked, and Cindy gasped. Adriana, where did you get those words? What words, Grandma? I didn't say a single foul word. The girl asked innocently. She could have sworn her grandmother was laughing. However, Adriana was far more concerned about her father's reaction. When she looked at her parent, she tried to think of something serious to say, or she would have laughed out loud. The solid businessman blushed and gulped for air as he was thrown on the shore. But his blonde date didn't seem the least bit embarrassed. Rick, it's okay, she said with a smile. Adriana was just nervous. Really, Adriana nodded to the girl, thinking that Slaga wasn't as stupid as she seemed at first. I wonder why she stood up for me. Adriana wondered. I'll have something to think about tonight before I go to bed. The feast went on as usual. Clara went out of her way to charm Cindy. More chicken, Lesjinka. In a secular tone, Grandma asked. No, thank you dazzlingly, smiled the guest. Everything is delicious, but I've had enough for today. I'm watching my figure. That's commendable. Cindy said approvingly. Perhaps a Greek soldier, then. I've read that salads and leaves are very beneficial in that respect. Well, go ahead, nodded Nancy. When she fell asleep, she puzzled over the question for a long time, but didn't come up with anything. It's elementary, Miranda exclaimed. She wants to be friends with you. She's sucking up to you, but we don't know what she has in mind. What were you praying for, Adriana? Molly was at the games and pretended to be nice too. And then Molly got sent to Switzerland. So what do we do now? Well, to fight with her now certainly do not need to, authoritatively stated Miranda. Especially since it was Clara who stood up for you. So, nothing. Let's see what happens next. If you communicate with her, you'll be aware of everything. You won't know what to prepare for. Okay, by who? Adriana, with respect. Looking at Miranda's classmate from third grade, I dreamed of becoming a psychologist. And not just dreamed, but did everything to make her dream come true. She read smart books and from time to time looked for interesting materials on the internet, which was not used by everyone at that time. Adriana herself dreamed of doing business like her dad. She knew she would never become a glamour doll like this Nancy. Many of the girls in the class clumsily imitated such ladies, certainly not Adriana. First of all, because she knew exactly what to imitate. It's not cool. Second, Adriana's glamorous style. As she once said, no way. And after getting acquainted with this, Clara Adriana is unlikely to have a desire to dress glamorously. Yes, even the word glamour annoyed her. No, she's going to be a businesswoman. That's the kind of look I'd like to see. It's not some harlot in furs and tracks, dreaming of getting a rich man. And the fact that Adriana was disgraced by money was not in doubt. But why doesn't daddy notice it? 
Is love really evil? Well, if you understand, then go ahead. I believe in you. Miranda encouraged her. Don't worry, we'll get through this. Meanwhile, her father and grandmother were talking about Adriana. How do you like it? Rick asked his mother. Question. How long have we been asleep? Cindy just grinned. Oh, come on. Nothing terrible happened. Adriana's just jealous. She just said something like that without thinking. It was five minutes later and no one remembered it. Or did they? I just wonder how you know so much about male-female relationships. Rick, please, laughed the mother. Or did you talk about poetry with your friends when you were her age? Well, no, of course not. Well, why? It's all the same. All right, calm down and take it easy. The fact that Rick called his mother during business hours was a big deal. It means he's really worried. Was he beginning to be able to show his feelings? Cindy thought, for better or worse. Mother, how do you like Clara? Rick asked. Well, she's very nice. Mother didn't answer right away. I don't hear confidence in her voice. Son, but it's your life, as long as you're sure of your feelings. You are sure? I am. All right then. I don't like that girl, Cindy said to her ex-wife. When Rick introduced me to Kathy, I thought that's the girl he'd be happy with, because he was. Too bad it didn't last. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Lisa smiled sadly. With you on the contrary. I got back after such grief, and I'm glad you're remembering. Kathy, with a kind word. So, if she deserves it, and this one, God forgive me, some not natural, fake, not sincere. Well, it's Rick she's already got to live with, remarked the relative. Well, yes, we can only hope that the first impression will be deceptive. But for Adriana my heart aches. I thought he was friendly with her. You can tell he's just sucking up, and it's not like he's just trying to please you out of the goodness of his heart. Cindy, I don't recognize you. Lisa smiled again. This time, it was cheerful and cheerful. What do we do? We're not going to let our granddaughter get hurt, but we won't. A month after that memorable dinner, Macduff made his beloved an official proposal. When Adriana heard about it, she was stunned. Why are you so rambling? Asked her grandmother Lisa after the dinner in honor of the engagement Rick Slara. It's understandable why, though. The girl is definitely not thrilled with her stepmother-to-be, and jealousy too. Is that what you think? With a strained smile replied the granddaughter. Poor girl, the older woman thought, and is worried, but doesn't want to show how scared she is. Maybe she could talk to Rick and take Adriana back to her house. After all, they would have a child someday, maybe more than one. He won't have a daughter. Adriana was really scared. Unlike her grandmother, she didn't think that she might have a brother or sister. Glamorous ladies and children in Adriana's understanding combined about as well as cutlets with condensed milk. But her departure abroad seemed to be a done deal. Stunning and lovely. A femme fatal. You're a beauty. The chirping of their bridesmaids. It was unstoppable. They were broadcasting so loudly that Adriana got a headache. And the party was just beginning. A celebration for whom? As much as I disliked her. Adriana had to admit that Clara looked beautiful. She was expecting a bofin dress with deep bow ties. But nothing like that. The bride's dress was sewn from beautifully glimmering belligerent material and resembled snow screaming in the sun. It was slightly sheer from the bottom and beautiful when walking. And thanks to the microscopic fur, Snow White and Bolero for the wedding outfit looked even richer and respectable. Her smooth hair was arranged in a deliberately careless, but very spectacular hairstyle. Makeup was made in warm colors and delicately Karalova. And the lipstick was much more than doll-like pink. Probably, Daddy gave a lot of money, thought Adriana and immediately berated himself. What am I talking about? Not today, so tomorrow I will be sent to a foreign boarding school for unwanted children of the rich. And I'm talking about money. The guests were divided into my father's business partners and lying glamorous girlfriends, not counting the rare relatives on both sides. The latter were only a dozen or so. 
I wonder where her parents are. Adriana thought. I have no idea, shrugged Cindy's grandmother. Rick never talked about her parents. Is she an orphan or something? Probably, she answered indifferently. Adriana had realized almost immediately that her grandmother wasn't thrilled with her new daughter-in-law. And now she was 200% sure of it. But since she respected her son's choice, she preferred to keep quiet. But what would happen if she really had a new grandchild? After the registry office, everyone went to some wildly fancy country club. The team organized contests, offered the guests to participate in filming, singing, or dancing. I must say, the solid businessmen were happy to read poems, perform interesting numbers, and laugh like children relaxing after hard work. With respect, thought Adriana. Wives of businessmen behave more restrained and even somehow prim. Dry wobblers in coucher outfits, she giggled to herself. However, these ladies were more sympathetic to Adriana than Elysium, and the half-naked girlfriends, lying around with their eyes glittering like Christmas trees. The girls wasted no time. Every now and then they shot their eyes at the businessmen. Their spouses also did not lose vigilance. After a few numbers, the Toastmaster announced a disco. Bridesmaids squealed with delight, jumped out to dance. It seemed that they were about to jump out of their already purely symbolic clothes. Adriana suddenly had a terrible need to pee. So she went in search of a public place. Ellen told the receptionist to go down the hall to the end and to the left. In front of the restroom, there was a sort of an anteroom that looked like a barbershop. There were a couple of chairs, some mirrors with sticks with plywood on them. What was that for? Adriana wondered. But remembering that this is a country club, suggested that perhaps vacationers come here to dry their hair after the pool. The anteroom was set up with pots and masons with flowers. Paradise. Thought with admiration of the stall where the folks did their natural needs, was separated by a partition of finished glass. If it were not for the inscription, Dear Visitors of the Club, kindly request a flush after yourself. A man wandering in by accident would not have guessed that he had entered such a prosaic place as a toilet. Having done her business, Adriana hurriedly left the stall as she suddenly heard. Lucky you closed such a money muffin was enough to boring. With a sigh said the new stepmother Adriana, feeling that she would hear something interesting. And so she froze. The lighter clicked and soon the room was filled with the smell of tobacco with a dash of net flowers or fruit. What a problem to have someone funnier than a church friend. No, of course not. Nancy giggled. I mean, are you guys planning on having kids? Rick wants to, but I don't want to. Maybe in three years. But right now, no way. This is not the kind of poverty I've chosen to live in. I still want to live for myself, and preferably well. I think I deserve it. What can you say? Good for you. Parents, do you know you can't be home now? Crazy, exclaimed the new wife of the businessman. They're just embarrassing. Imagine if they showed up at the wedding and bought it. Yeah. How do you tell a man you don't want to have a baby? I can't. I'll just give in and take the pill. Adriana took a breath. At 12 years old, she was well informed. What pills are we talking about? The fact that she's not planning to have a baby yet is certainly good. But the fact that it's Coquina deceiving the father is out of line. Although Adriana didn't expect anything else. Despite her young age, she was a remarkably perceptive girl and doubted the sincerity of Clara. And there you have it. Adriana's limbs were bleeding from sitting in the same position, but she was afraid to move. Then she should go straight to the Pantheon. The friends chatted about something else and left. Adriana took a deep breath and sat down in the chair. We've got to get her out of here, she thought. Her Macduff Harris was. Surely she would certainly do it. True, she didn't know how yet. But was that a problem? It's the desire that counts and that's not counting her love for her father. At the end of the wedding party came out to throw her bouquet unmarried girl and her girlfriends as if mad. The ladies were totally unglamorous, panting, pushing each other away. One of them couldn't hold on to her high stilettos and fell, 
they must be itching to get married. And preferably, as well as Clara. She remembered her stepmother's conversation with her friend and frowned. So she had parents after all. She was ashamed of them. Adriana remembered Slag's words. She was crazy to be ashamed of them. Imagine, they'd show up at the wedding, and then they'd be stubborn. Her stepmother, the daughter of alcoholics, came out. Adriana shook her head. Her thoughts were interrupted by a shriek. A happy man had caught the bride's bouquet. Here with the throwing of the bandage, friends, the groom came out a tab. Single men present at the wedding banquet is not in a hurry to bind themselves to the bonds of Hymenaeus. Can you imagine? It is Mops, white-haired, cheating daddy, Adriana said indignantly. She and Miranda sat in a cafe and read delicious ice cream. And Adriana was telling her friend about her father's wedding. The friend gave her a second serving of cold dessert. But Adriana from indignation could not taste the flavor and could not appreciate it. She is taking pills so she won't get pregnant and tell daddy she wants a baby. Can you believe I want to expose her? I just don't know how to find out where she keeps those pills and visit Uncle Rick. Miranda shrugged. Ah well, yeah, I guess so, pondered Adriana. She began to watch her stepmother and eventually found out that she carried the pills in her purse. It was that simple. Well, look out for the creature, the girl exulted. Now the main thing is to find the right moment, and he did not wait long. Cindy's anniversary was, as always, heartwarming. Unless, of course, you count Clara's sour face, her grumbling about the overly colorful dishes, as if she wasn't the one who had eaten almost half of the cake the day before. I guess Grandma's delicious cakes and salads aren't too glamorous for our slaga. With a chuckle, Adriana thought with gusto, flying away salty in a tube, stuffed with ham and cheese and herbs. That evening, when they arrived home, Adriana dropped her stepmother's purse, which she had set on the floor as if unintentionally. It couldn't have been a better place. You can't be more careful, Clara whispered hatefully, looking at her stepdaughter. You bet, because the package of contraceptives fell out of her purse right at her husband's feet. I didn't do it on purpose. Adriana exclaimed indignantly, picking up the pills. She found a place to put them. Indeed, remarked Rick. And then he asked Clara, are you sick? Rick repeated, and there was a hint of concern in his voice, just a slight hint of sleep. I knew that my father had a volcano in his soul. It had something to do with us not working out. And I think in the most direct and mysterious way, Adriana said in a mysterious voice, handing the pills to my father. Clara, you're the measure of a stepdaughter, with your annihilating gaze. I explained everything. Of course you did, nodded Macduff. And I could hear the threat in his voice. Oh my God, really? Adriana thought happily. However, she was disappointed in the morning. At breakfast, her stepmother and father looked like lovebirds, not the slightest hint that he was going to put out that armful. And what would that mean? Puzzled thought Adriana. So far, the darling has labeled it directly. Clara kissed her spouse on the lips. When Rick and his daughter had breakfast, they went to the car. Daddy, do you think I'm little and don't understand anything? After a little thought, Adriana decided. No, I'm not, assured her father, pulling out of the yard. Then I have a question. I'm listening, as usual, she said discreetly. Dad, have you forgiven her? I have nothing to forgive her for. What do you mean? Nothing. And the pills? What about the pills? Macduff shrugged. Clara explained it all to me. Aha. Uh -huh. And what did she explain to you then? Adriana, what kind of interrogation is this? Clara and I are two adults who can work things out between ourselves. I'm just curious. I'm a woman to be after all. At least I'll know what kind of noodles to tell him. Adriana smiled slightly. But why noodles? If you're so mature, I'll explain on my fingers. The doctor advised Clara to take the pills and then stop. It's kind of like if you stop, it comes on. The result of my father's embarrassment was a little amusing. Adriana, no, he's not so dishonest. 
thought the daughter with satisfaction. What's so strange about it, though? It's not like he's a robot. There's a limit to everything. That would be all right. But the explanation that Clara gave her father, I'm not convinced. Adriana is obviously lying. Miranda declared unequivocally, when the friends joined together in a secluded corner during recess, if that were true, your dad would know about it. Except it didn't work out. Adriana said sadly, it wasn't evening yet. On the way home from school, Adriana often visited her grandmother, or rather, grandmothers, because Grandma Lisa spent most of her free time at Cindy's. That's just how it is. Unfortunately, saints often dislike each other. But that had nothing to do with Adriana's grandmothers. Cindy had once loved Kathy like family and had become firm friends with her mother, their husbands. Christopher, although they were great friends, Cindy and Lisa were good friends. Adriana adored both grandmothers and was proud of their friendship. My grandmothers are the best. With pride, she thought. Adriana opened the door with her key and smiled. They are. The grandmothers briefly into your singing again. It's the lovelies with tenderness in her voice, said hello grandma Lisa, thinking how much her granddaughter was becoming like Kathy. And as she grew older, the resemblance only grew stronger. The same piercing blue eyes and unruly golden blonde hair that Adriana used to wear in a ponytail. Her late mother had favored an elegant one. Hello, dragonfly, Kathy Cindy repeated. Why are you puffed up? Like a mouse on grits. Did you get an F? Well, I'd rather have gotten a D, said her granddaughter sullenly. What is it? Asked grandmother, guessing that the stepmother again did not please her something. And thought it seems that in fairy tales stepmother stepdaughter, and indeed something is something. But jokes are jokes, but the girl is suffering. Is it that my dad seems to have gone blind, or has love made him a little dull? Adriana answered and told the story of the pills. But maybe Clara told the truth. Grandma, you even splashed her granddaughter's hands. Frankly speaking, Cindy herself did not believe it. However, the old woman thought it was wrong to show it to her granddaughter. Otherwise, she would be turning the girl against her stepmother and against her father as well. Cindy could not help guessing that Adriana understood how she felt about her daughter-in-law, but she should behave like a wise grandmother. It hurts me that this white-haired bitch is deceiving daddy. Adriana, but you don't know anything. Lisa must have quietly remarked. Why not? I don't know. Yes, I do. Adriana smiled mysteriously. So it turns out that Clara is not an orphan. Cindy said thoughtfully. When her granddaughter told her about the conversation overheard in the country club restroom, it turns out, nodded Adriana. She said she was an orphan. Yeah, she didn't say anything at all, Grandma recalled. But you know what I'll tell you. Adriana, honey, don't get involved in their relationship. It won't end well. Let them try to send me to boarding school. What boarding house have I interrupted you in the meantime? Cindy animate with surprise. I know which one a foreign one, to Switzerland or to England father that was going to send you abroad. The older woman wondered, thinking that Adriana was right when she said that love made Rick's mind tight. He didn't tell me anything. Having said that, Cindy smiled to herself. Rick had been consulting his mother a lot lately, and she liked that a lot. Yeah, but what's the story with the boarding house? What do you have to do with dad? Adriana waved it off with annoyance. It's just that Miranda was telling me how the stepmother treated Vika from the cottage next door. Molly, what cottage was she talking about? Completely confused grandmother. Which is next door to my friend Miranda's parents launched into a girl's explanation. Oh my God. Cindy laughed with relief. I thought you'd listen to your girlfriends. They'll say other things. Do you really think Lisa and I would let you down? Well, you will, Tanya. Tanya nodded with a smile. As for Papa and Clark, life will put everything in its place. How long will it take? Grandma continued her lecture and gently, pressing the tip of her nose. Adriana asked with a smile. The granddaughter nodded. Well, super, summarized Cindy. Then girls, let's have lunch. I don't know about you, but I'm starving. 
Lisa, what are we having for lunch today? Borscht, Lisa said proudly, and mashed potatoes with the poor when it's all done. It is known, when while you were at the clinic, you got sick, worried Adriana, unwittingly remembering how her father asked the fox about it. What a bastard, with hatred thought she stepmother. No, she shook her head with a smile. Cindy, just prophylactic, and noticing the incredulous look on her granddaughter's face she laughed. But honestly, it's all good. Discussions on the ethics and psychology of family life, I declare closed. Better tell me, what would you like to get as a birthday present? Immersed in the experience, Adriana completely forgot that in a week's time her birthday is 13 years. A bloody dozen, which, by the way, became Adriana's lucky day. The birth of the only daughter of a Macduff businessman was decided to celebrate in a small family circle. Grandmother Cindy presented her granddaughter with a cute and bright blue pants, and Grandmother Lisa presented her granddaughter with a youthful toilet water with a marvelous food aroma. And this from me and Clara trembled. In a voice pronounced Rick and Adriana, not without surprise realized that the father worried. He held out a box to his daughter, seeing that it showed a cell phone. Adriana squealed with delight. It was for me she threw herself around her father's neck. Well, who else? Rick grinned, awkwardly, hugging the birthday girl. Dad and I wish you happiness, in a secular tone, said Clara, stretching her brightly painted mouth almost to her ears. It was as if that pill scene had never happened. True, Adriana's thoughts at the Meckle convention couldn't hold back, limiting herself to words of gratitude. Wow, what a cool phone with a color display. That's great. And this was Adriana's first cell phone. Some students already went to school with cell phones, but where were their tadpoles from giving nasty TV Kenny and her phones? Adriana's delight was unbounded. Got the recorder, she said, looking at the options. What are the tombs on there? So moonlit haze. Adriana, baby, come sit with us. Cindy asked with a smile. More on any chassis. Come on, come on, don't argue. It was undoubtedly one of Adriana's best birthdays, but she had no idea that fate had another pleasant surprise in store for her. Adriana had fallen in love with the number 13. One night, a couple months after her stepdaughter's birthday, she announced that she was pregnant. Are you sure? Asked Rick. I'm sure. And I thought you were excited. I am. No, no. I'm really glad. Adriana sat next to me and pretended to watch TV. She wondered if Clara was pregnant. She was already convinced that her stepmother would lie. She'd take it cheap. But how could she know? Adriana thought, and finally came to the conclusion that there would be day, there would be food. And Clara read when I will be discharged from the maternity hospital, and we will be photographed. Me, you, and our baby. I also want balloons, lots of flowers, a limo, photo shoots. Clara, did you confuse the discharge from the hospital with the wedding? Rick grinned. No, now everyone does that. And what do you say? Adriana didn't even immediately realize that her stepmother was addressing her. When she did, she shrugged. What am I supposed to say? The only thing I could say is that Clara does not need a child, but flowers, balloons, Oh, and a limo. What's a limo without a limo? Unless, of course, the stepmother really is pregnant. So you will have a brother or sister, said Slaga in a tone, as if it was about the whole area of my life. When I will, then I will tell you, said the stepdaughter, and went to her room. But things thought Adriana. What if she really is pregnant? I'll go to my grandmother's to sew. Except which one? She decided she would think about it tomorrow, and strangely enough, fell asleep instantly. Adriana didn't recognize her father. Mr. Macduff still maintained his trademark poker face. However, there was a change in his behavior. He gave Clara a gift every day. Modest, but very nice gifts, bouquets of baskets of flowers. Carefully thought out daily menu mused his wives, feet of feet, and as an exemplary future daddy uncomplainingly forgave her caprices and mood swings. Was it like that with mom too? I asked his grandmother. Well, 
Pretty much, yes, Cindy nodded. The only difference is that then my father did not have extra money for flowers and knickknacks. Grandma is glad that you will have another grandson or granddaughter. Well, how could a grandmother not be glad about that? In fact, the elderly woman is a little bit crooked. She would certainly be happy to nurse another grandson, but something prevented her from rejoicing fully. And then Cindy realized that she was the one who had doubts that her daughter-in-law was really pregnant. Rick's mother herself didn't understand where she was getting that doubt from. But there it was. Maybe I'm paranoid. The older woman thought with a chuckle and immediately dismissed the thought. No, it didn't look like that. And meanwhile, Clara was twisting Macduff as she wished. When she said she was cold, her husband carefully covered her with a plaid. When Slaga was hot, Rick uncomplainingly turned on the air conditioner. In addition, Rick had a professional video camera for the discharge from the maternity hospital. That's the way to become a jack of all trades, thought Adriana. Looking at this, shall we say, family TV. The Macduff couple was sitting on the couch. They were watching TV. Beside them stood a pala of strawberries and cherries with whipped cream and a saucer with two small cakes. Adriana settled back in her chair in anticipation of another play. Love, I suppose. I want some water with lemon. Capriciously, the stepmother said. Rick just sighed and went to the kitchen, and when he came back with a glass of water, with either racer floating in it, Slara said thank you. I don't want any more. Macduff sat down on the couch and put his arm around his wife. Rick, you know what I thought. I'm all smiles. I need some positive vibes right now. It's so encouraging. Nodded Rick. It's not like you want to go to a resort. Adriana grinned to herself. And I want to quit, said Clara. But old girl, you disappoint me, don't you? Quit? Macduff interjected. Aha. Uh -huh. Disarming smiled his wife, pressing herself against his shoulder. I want to prepare for motherhood in a quiet environment to visit museums, exhibitions, and just walk in the fresh air. But I think we can afford it, nodded Rick. Thank you, beloved, that's all. Well, to be honest, there's more, Clara said shyly. Would you like to go somewhere? Still, I underestimated you. A trip, repeated the husband thoughtfully. Yes, of course, with my favorite man, but you know I don't have time. Well, I was so hopeful. Disappointed, said Clara. What can you do? With sincere regret, said Rick. The only thing I can offer you is to go alone. Why not? You'll have a rest to unwind and prepare, so to speak, morally for the birth of the baby. Where would you like to go? Well, let's just say Egypt. Okay, and Egypt. So Egypt, I'll arrange it. Clara shone like a copper penny in the sun and smacked him on the cheek and said I have the best husband in the world. I tried to jokingly with a bow, replied Rick, and added, and I have a wife. You are so beautiful. At this point, the father reminded of his son John, who not so long ago began to hit on her, then a chocolate bar, then texts, and the other day John panted awkwardly told Adriana that he liked her and invited her to the movies. Adriana promised to think about it. I guess I'm the kind of woman who's good during pregnancy. Nancy, what does pregnancy have to do with it? You're as beautiful as ever. You've got a lot of nerve. Adriana thought indignantly, is it okay to have a baby? She said a deep good night and retired to the bedroom. Let it all roll on. And you know, I think I'll have a drink of water. Adriana heard and grinned. After Clara quit her job, she was always missing somewhere. Although why is it known? Were the store, beauty salons, sitting in cafes, in the company of the same glamorous ladies. In general, a full set of pleasures, the young wife of a businessman. Macduff was very reverent towards his pregnant wife. It is understandable, because the life of the first wife was cut short at the moment of childbirth. Clara. Have you been to the doctor? Rick asked. Yes, of course. And how's our baby? He's fine. What about the trip to Egypt? Oh, I forgot. Here you go. He slaps himself on the forehead, and he's cool. 
I'm going to Egypt. I'm in. Adriana, having learned that her stepmother was going to a resort, sighed with relief at least 10 days off from her. But fate had something more interesting in store for the Macduff Harris. But even for this stupid report in despair, said Adriana in despair for the tenth time search in the school backpack. The social studies report was a matter of life and death. People from the education department would be present at the defense of the report, which she had been preparing for three whole months. Are you sure you put it in the backpack? Miranda asked. Yes, I did. Adriana said annoyed. Although she suddenly remembered how she had already unzipped her backpack in the hallway and intended to put the report in it, but decided to educate herself, Adriana burned herself and left the apartment, and the report remained lying on the shelf. What? 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 what nothing and did not put it home. Nervously, she said. Asking Betty to leave shrugged Miranda's shoulders. Well, what else is there to do? Yes. The defense would make it in time. Their class teacher was not a bad woman. She was as accommodating as the situation allowed. So it wasn't going to be a problem. And so it was. Betty gave the okay, and Adriana ran to the bus stop. As she opened the door, she heard her stepmother's voice, getting ready to deliver the baby. And I mean it, she has no idea. Adriana, not thinking long, turned on the recorders, stood at the entrance to the kitchen, from where not only came the voice of Clara, but also smelled luck of a tobacco. The stepmother fell silent, and Adriana grimaced. Pisanka, sweetie, say something else, say something. She mentally begged her spouse and father, forgetting about the report. What the hell does a report when a viper has penetrated their family? Well, I'm going to Egypt to have a blast, and then I have a miscarriage. Well, the hospital's got it covered. It'll give Kevin a chance to prove his love. Because, yeah, they're all assholes. But that's good for us, right? Giggled the sneaky Clara. After the miscarriages, did you beg him for a trip to Thailand? No, Paris. Adriana decided that was enough. God forbid, she would go out into the hallway and warm the candlestick standing by the mirror in the hallway. As if in a dream, she took the report from the shelf and left the apartment unnoticed. Adriana did not remember defending the report. She had said something, answered some questions, and came to her senses, when the social studies teacher Joe said approvingly, Well done, Macduff. Adriana walked out of the classroom and sank into a chair. Her classmates looked around, hesitant to come in. Finally, John Michelson, apparently, decided that he could not breathe before his death, crossed himself and said, God be with you, and disappeared into the study. What's the matter with you? Asked Miranda, looking intently at her friend. You're not well, Miranda, then, Adriana said tiredly. She didn't remember how long she had been staring at the same spot. When she came to her senses, she had already defended her report, but she had calmed down a little. Adriana nodded and said, let's go. That's the bomb. Miranda exclaimed when she heard the recorder and the tape, and when you're going to blow it up, I'm going to blow it up right now. Adriana said firmly, Rick is busy, said the secretary, but the girl didn't seem to hear her. Adriana burst into the office and said from the doorstep, Dad, I need to talk to you. It's very important. The secretary from Rick entered the office. I tried to stop her, but she, Olga, everything is fine, soothed her Macduff, and the girl with a sigh of relief left the office. What such an important business brought you to my work? Good-naturedly asked the father. Instead of answering, Adriana turned on the dictaphone. Why, shall I go to Egypt? I'm going to have a great time there, and then I'll have a miscarriage. I heard Macduff. The young wife's voice got darker, but the hospital's got it covered. At the same time, we give Kevin a chance to prove his love. Otherwise, yes, they're all asses. Turn it off. Rick cut him off. Adriana, I hope you're not doing that right now. She didn't have time to finish. Bolotov took the phone and gestured for his daughter to be quiet. The girl obediently nodded. Now Adriana was sure that she had achieved her goal and felt good and calm. Are you close to home? 
asked Rick, after which he told his wife they needed to talk. Let's go, shall we? He turned to his daughter. Let's go. You wanted to talk to me, Nancy asked with a smile. She was wearing a revealing dress, dark red in color, lipstick to match the dress, carelessly curls almost to her waist. What can I say? Good looking. But it didn't matter now. Yes, I did. But first, you have to show me all the papers that prove you're pregnant. But they're at the hospital, and Nancy's flying around scared. Well, let's say I call the hospital you're seeing. But why? Really, no reason, agreed Adriana. Be a friend. Turn on the tape. It's not like that. That's not what I meant to say at all. We were joking and shut up. Macduff said softly but sternly, here's your 15 minutes to pack. Time's up. Or maybe I'm a jackass, but I'm not going to let myself be fooled. Rick's favorite faux pas exclaimed the sneaky piss shamefully and explained everything to Clara, not testing my patience. Macduff was adamant for 14 minutes, but I, Adriana, it's just you know it. I know. I was an idiot. But luckily it's not too late to fix it. Take all the jewelry. We don't need Adriana. And get the hell out of here in 13 minutes. Surprisingly, from that day on, the father-daughter relationship changed dramatically. They had many conversations about everything. Macduff seemed to rediscover this surprisingly wise girl, his daughter. He had to have figured out the fox. From time to time, Rick wondered if he regretted it and suddenly realized that he didn't. I guess I didn't love her, Macduff once told his mother. Of course you didn't love her, he hummed, but mother, that's a different name for it. Even a detained man like you is no stranger to passion, which fortunately passes. Fortunately, Rick interjected, looking thoughtfully at his mother. In this case, certainly. Maybe, maybe. But what the hell with her? I have wonderful parents, a beautiful daughter, a job I love. I happen to be a lucky man. Robert, what do you want to be? Rick asked me once. I want to be in business. Without hesitation, answered the daughter. What about you? How's that? Unexpected. Frankly speaking, he always thought that business is a man's business, and a woman should be engaged exclusively in women's affairs, choosing business. A woman, in his opinion, loses her femininity. Solid, successful business lady looks great, visits beauty salons, dresses expensively. However, the real woman was in her at least kill me, did not see. But now, looking at this girl, she looked remarkably like his late wife. Rick thought she'd make a great business lady. What about femininity? How do I know what they're like at home with family and friends? I've been dreaming about it since elementary school, Adriana admitted. Well. Welcome to the world of business. When the Macduff Harris went into her senior year, she recalled with a laugh how she was afraid that her father, with a pitch from the right, was expecting her to go abroad. Now studying outside her native country didn't seem like something terrible to her. Moreover, she firmly knew that she wanted to study at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Why? Sounds solid. Dad remarked, because it's one of Britain's leading centers for business development and entrepreneurship. There's a Department of Economics, Finance, Management Law, and International Relations. Wow, but it's not bullshit, nodded Rick. So what did you choose? I chose economics, where without it, especially since it includes the rest of the above. And there are electives too. Adriana's enthusiasm energized her father. The grandmothers, of course, wooed and awed that the only granddaughter was going to study so far away. But the girl only laughed. Grandma Lisa, Grandma Cindy. First of all, I haven't gotten in yet. And second of all, in the age of the internet, is that a problem? But both grandfathers were looking at their granddaughter. With respect. But for what? Ivan Petrovich remarked. We didn't have such opportunities. So Adriana will learn and at the same time she will look at the world. And there, and then, look, and a foreign groom will find good-naturedly, laughed Fyodor. Well, why not? Flirtatiously smiled granddaughter. 
By the way, there are students from different countries, so I'll become some kind of blue Vanessa or Mrs. Everyone laughed. The attempt to get an education abroad was successful, and Adriana flew to London. Ten years later, Adriana, the Germans have arrived, reported to the secretary. Thank you, seeing them off after the meeting with the Germans and the upcoming business negotiations in a restaurant. And then she had to work in the office. All in all, free time was worth its weight in gold. But Adriana Macduff, and all that was madly enjoying it. Five years ago, she graduated from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And a year ago, Rick, convinced that his daughter perfectly coped with the duties of the head of the firm, stepped away from the business. He married a good woman whose name was Galena. And soon after the marriage, the newlyweds moved to the country house Macduff. Sam Morrison, with whom he started the business together, had long ago sold Macduff his share and left for Miami. So now Adriana was at the helm of a powerful mechanism, and she did it well. Mom, as well as grandparents, who also passed away, were proud of her. The personal life of one of the successful business ladies was shrouded in mystery, and therefore about Adriana Macduff, and judged a hell of a lot. One inexplicably from where they took that, most likely she was abandoned by a certain English lord. Allegedly, that's why Adriana returned to Russia as a beaten dog. Others were convinced of her unconventional orientation. And these others knew that an employee of the prosecutor's office was pining for the spectacular business lady. By the way, the employee had indeed been a player on Adriana since high school. And he was none other than classmate John Michelson. But what did orientation have to do with it? That's what she never realized. Because if everyone who doesn't reciprocate is suspected of being LGBT, the world will go crazy. And soon Adriana Macduff met her future husband. What did she do to stir up the business community? It happened at the presentation of a new perfume and a wildly fashionable young fashion designer already. May I invite you? She heard a pleasant baritone somewhere above her. Raising her eyes, Adriana saw a handsome, brutal blonde man who obviously did not neglect the gym. Why not? After a slow dance, Stephen, as Playboy's name was, suggested a drink. And then he asked Adriana if we should get out of here. The young woman looked at Stephen in amazement. But no, if you find my suggestion too impertinent, you know, it doesn't. Adriana smiled enigmatically. Really? Of course it does, because it is, I'm sorry. I guess we misunderstood each other, Stephen said. Apparently so. She nodded and took pity on her unexpected suitor. I like your proposal very much, so what are we waiting for? Still Stephen stopped by a restaurant that works until the last customer. They ordered a bunch of food and two bottles of red wine. The bartender and the waiter threw now and then in their direction, suffering looks, but they were in no hurry to leave. I had never had such a good and easy time with any man Adriana had ever been with. True, there weren't that many men, but still, her first man was the son of a Parisian businessman named Pierre. Could frogmen learn from them French phrases on which they, in fact, and mocked, and a month later the young people parted. Zanudes was not to her taste. With her second lover Adriana met during a walk in the National Park. He George worked in a small construction company, loved sports, and had a great sense of humor. The couple dated for two years, but in the end it didn't work out. Then there were some other hobbies, which were limited to innocent flirting. Of course, there was also John Michelson, who had loved Estonia since eighth grade. But he was so good that Adriana felt she had no right to give him hope. Let him already find someone who will love him and make him happy. Adriana recalled how she had returned from London. John had arrived at her door with a bouquet of roses. Tall, handsome, dressed to perfection. He smelled of expensive perfume. And his career, as far as she knew, was on the upswing. What a way for a girl to look. Adriana thought, I don't need other girls, I only want you. I'm willing to wait for you as long as it takes, and John waited, and for good reason. Adriana came home at midnight, 
intoxicated not so much by the wine as by Stephen's charm, and happy beyond belief, but not bothering to take off her makeup and wash it off. She poked her under the covers and fell asleep with a blissful smile. Stephen Adriana's relationship was progressing rapidly. She felt she had met her man, but he was slippery. Said Miranda, with whom Adriana was still friends. Well, I don't like him, that's all. I feel like there's something wrong with him that I'm surprised to hear, Adriana exclaimed. Stephen is cool. When you get to know him better, you'll change your mind about him. I don't think you even know what he does. Of course I do. He has a business in another city. What kind of business? A real estate agency. And you know what kind of agency? Did Miranda keep up? What kind of interrogation is this? Adriana wrinkled his nose. He said the name I don't remember. And you didn't even ask around. Adriana. Adriana shook her head. I remember when your papa hen married Clara. You said that love had robbed him of his ability to think. Well, I can say the same thing about you. I don't like him. Well, the important thing is that I like him. Giggled the business lady in love and added seriously, Miranda, you are a wonderful psychologist, but you are wrong about Stephen. He's a good man and I'm comfortable with him. I would pay attention to John if I were you, but you are not in my place. Adriana argued reasonably. Then everything will be fine. Miranda wasn't so sure about that either. Her father wasn't thrilled about his daughter's suitors either, but he said it was your life. I won't interfere, but remember, if you need any help, I'll always help you in any way I can. Thanks, Dad. Adriana hugged her father. A month later, Stephen proposed to Adriana, and she said yes. Aren't you in too much of a hurry? Miranda expressed her doubts. I beg you, she said with a smile. If I realize that I've met the one I want to spend the rest of my life with, then why wait? People date for years and then get divorced. So why wait? My friend thought about it. As a psychologist, she realized that in the words of her friend had common sense. Indeed, why wait? They are not students who have no money or housing, but something that did not believe in real estate agency or extraterrestrial love at first sight. After all, Adriana is a grown woman and knows what she's doing, Miranda thought. After a lavish wedding, the newlyweds flew to Spain, honeymoon to the rhythms of flamenco, so titled Estonia album, with photos of the vacation in social network. After seeing these photos, John Michelson got so drunk that he came to himself for two days. Thankfully, it was a weekend. Having returned from Spain, Adriana began to look at the house. She had long dreamed of it, but she had no time to deal with the issue. Jen, you are my realtor. With a smile said Adriana, cozily, nestled on her husband's lap. Maybe in your office there are suitable options. So this summer, all solvent buyers at the resorts during the waiting for the baby. That's true. But you do realize. What if I recognize it? Finally found the right one online today. It was a lovely mansion with a large modern bathhouse, a meshless barbecue area, and an above-ground garage. The house was close to a forest area. This was a nice bonus for Adriana. We'll walk in the woods, pick berries and mushrooms, the young woman thought dreamily. Do you like it? She asked her husband. It's all right, nodded Stephen. Let's take it. Why not? The couple worked hard, but despite this, they managed to make time for socializing. In the evenings, they walked in the woods and tried to find the first mushrooms of August. There are no mushrooms there, good-naturedly said an elderly neighbor, a retired general, as well as berries used to grow, and now everything. No more. I see. Well, then we will walk in the forest, enjoying nature and breathing fresh air. Your newlyweds, the ex-military man winked cheerfully. Is it noticeable? Noticeable, nodded the neighbor. Older spouses don't usually hold hands, but God grant you many years of happiness. Thank you. The spouses replied with glee, laughing merrily. They ran into that one. I'll take a bath, said Stephen, gladly throwing off his dusty sandals. Shall we take it together? 
Adriana smiled meaningfully. Great idea, he smiled back. Then his cell phone rang. Looking at the display, Stephen pulled away from his wife and sat down in the wicker rocking chair, pressed the answer button. I missed you. I want to see you right now. The pestilence heard a woman's voice. I'll come all right. Suddenly, a hoarse voice answered Stephen, and turning off the six, he said, I have to leave urgently for work. Well? Well, you have to. Then you have to. She threw up her hands. I'm tired of waiting, pouted her lips. The young girl shook her luxurious golden red locks. Margot, for God's sake. Stephen laughed. We're Adriana, and we've only been married two months. Do you really think that in that time, you can accumulate a lot of property together? I don't think anything. Vanessa said capriciously, I just want to be with you. I really want to be with you too. Sincerely said, well, you're a smart girl. You realize that things don't get done that fast. Unless you want to make a really big score, not some little thing. Come on, sweetie, I gotta go. Oh, that's too bad. Auntie's coming over soon. We could have had tea. My doll, but you remember I'm a family man. Yeah, you'll forget that. Well, be patient. You're a clever girl. And hello to the aunt. Hello, darling, greeted Freud, a slender blonde in an expensive summer suit of delicate coral blossom. Hello, the girl smiled sadly. Stephen was, asked the aunt, nodding at the bouquet of tea roses. He was, he said hello to you. Vanessa replied with a sigh. He doesn't want a divorce. The woman sighed understandingly. Not that he doesn't want to, but he says it's too soon. His wife hasn't given him the right to act on her behalf or anything else. But then divorce is really out of the question, the aunt said. All that remains is to wait. Wife, at least you're pretty. Instead of answering, Vanessa entered social networks, showed a photo of the beloved with a wife pretty, but nothing special. Threw in a loving auntie. You're much prettier. Who does she remind me of? Maybe the owner of a hardware store and a repair store. Adriana Macduff. So now she's a smith. Macduff is slowly being reinterpreted by a relative. Did you two know each other? I was married to her father. After her divorce from Rick Macduff, she couldn't find work for a long time. Eventually, she got a job as a waitress, but it didn't last long. One day the beautiful blonde was noticed by one of the visitors and took her as a kept woman. He rented her an apartment, fed her, dressed her, and one day informed her that he had found another. You have the apartment at your disposal for a month, and then sorry. Slaga promptly found another sponsor, who put her in his luxurious dacha. Slaga lived there until one eye neighbor did not see a blonde staircase and reported it to his wife, and there was nowhere to go, so she left for her native village. Living with alcoholic parents is not very healthy, so she went back to the city. She worked as a maid, and for the first month she was allowed to live in a service room. And then luck smiled on Clara in the person of an old rich man from a neighboring vegetable garden. The old man was terminally ill, and after his death left Slaga an excellent two-room apartment, a substantial sum of money and some jewelry. Relatives of the deceased tried to resent, but could do nothing. Everything was according to the law, so they just had to accept it. A year ago, a niece, Vanessa, came to stay with him. The girl, like her aunt, wanted money and a beautiful life, but did not like to work. From time to time they got acquainted with wealthy men, but lately they got only amateurs, have a good time, and gift the beautiful ladies with a certain amount of money. Well, it's still bread. And here is such luck. Clara smiled. It seems that she had the opportunity to kill two birds at once to take revenge on not demolished girls, and at the same time, and attach her nephew. Clara knew about her affair with Stephen, who rented the apartment across the street and was privy to all the details. The only thing she didn't know was who his wife was with. What had she found out now? Margosha, it would not be possible to invite Stephen for tea. Let's say tomorrow with a haunted smile, inquired Stephen. I think I might be able to help you, shall we say?
speed things up. Two heads are certainly well better than one. And that's just fine. You see, my dear, I have my own scores to settle with this lady. Miranda loved her work as fondly as she loved her husband and two-year-old daughter. She did not stay long on maternity leave, and when the baby was one year old hired a nanny and went to work. The services of a psychologist from the center where Miranda worked were not cheap, so the salary was high. The staff was great, too. And the only thing Miranda didn't like was the hysterical rich ladies who obviously had nowhere to put their money. God, what an idiot, she thought as she saw off another well-dressed and hysterical person. Miranda grew up in a well-to-do family, and it was hard to imagine that her mother, the wife of a commercial director of a joint stock company, went to psychologists and complained about Krivorichko, their plastic surgeons, or lack of attention from her husband. And now in front of her sat a pretty slender brunette in a leather habitual suit, hung with gold and diamonds, like a Christmas tree. Well, what's wrong with me? Asked the woman, looking at Miranda, as if the patient's entire future life depended on her. The lady's lover was 15 years younger than her, but assured her that age was no obstacle to feelings. And further banal banal cavalier turned out to be a banal Alfonso marriage swindler. Dark-haired lady was so naive that she gave her lover passwords from bank accounts, which he took advantage of. My God, and how do all these ladies do business? Miranda thought with bewilderment, and remembering her friend, decided that love, unfortunately, not only opens, but also. You see, your lover actually did not do that to you, but to another rich one. Let's call things by their proper names. There's nothing personal about the victim. The client took a deep breath and suddenly said, would you like to see how handsome he is? Miranda did not have the slightest desire to look at some Alphonse swindler, but it couldn't be helped. Such intimate conversations were part of her job, and often the outcome of the conversation depended on it. Well, let's have a look, Miranda smiled. And when she saw the photo, she miraculously didn't fall off the table. Her friend's husband was looking at her. After seeing off the visitor, Miranda immediately dialed the number of her friend Adriana. Your husband is not who he says he is, Miranda. What nonsense, Adriana said tiredly. Tell me he's a foreign spy. What? What did you hear? You're just jealous that Jenka and I have such a beautiful relationship, and you and him are just like normal people. Really? What's going on here? That's what my friend said to Adriana. I won't let anyone speak ill of my husband, including you. I don't think we have anything else to talk about. Yeah, Adriana, look but Adriana's already passed out. Miranda leaned back in her chair in despair. She took no offense. Adriana. Fear for her friend was much stronger than resentment. Well, what to do now? Feverishly, she thought. Miranda, how to help her? Suddenly, she realized who could help her. Meanwhile, Adriana's husband, her former stepmother, and her niece were devising a plan. Do you like turnips? On soap operas in the car? Yes. I love Vanessa very much and I want to be with her. Looking into her eyes, Stephen replied. But what you're suggesting, no, I don't work out of the blue. No, girls much more effective and most importantly safer to divorce and pull half of the jointly acquired property. So the mansion was purchased during the marriage, right? Vanessa pointed out. Married. But Adriana said she wanted me to act on her behalf. The aunt exclaimed beautifully. She mentioned it. Remind her. And then Clara was eloquently silent. And then Adriana continued. After all, she may not agree to a divorce or leave you with a nose. We women are like that. And Adriana left. No man, no problem. Well, that's true, too, Stephen replied after some thought. There you go. Well, suppose I agree, he said, and felt it necessary to add, suppose. Well, how do you do it? All you men need to be taught, quite said Clara, realizing that the potential son-in-law by and large matured organize a favorite something like a second wedding trip and somewhere in the mountains or a body of water and abstract everything like an accident. Stephen drove home and pondered everything. His story was as simple as three chords. 
graduated from technical school with a job, and due to lack of experience complete flop. Stephen Smith had been scraping by on odd jobs. And one day, when he was loading goods in the store and came to get his legal $10, the owner exclaimed that he was so handsome and moonlighting as a baggage handler. The guy spitefully looked at the spectacular and not yet old woman and mumbled so offer something else. And she did. Stephen went home $100 richer. And then there were other rich women. And when he first saw his neighbor Vanessa, he was attracted to her and only later realized that he had fallen in love at first sight. For the sake of this girl, Stephen was ready to give up his business. But what could the beloved offer, except housing? Stephen saw more than once how men of various ages came to the entrance, and the aunt and niece left with them. But despite that, his feelings for Vanessa never went away. You're good. When Stephen first spoke to Vanessa, he thought she was very unhappy. We're both unhappy. Stephen thought and decided to break the cycle by all means. That's when he got the idea to find a rich bride. Marry and claim half of the supposedly jointly acquired property, which he did with Betty, the same lady who cried into Miranda's vest. Unfortunately, her lawyer turned out to be a real professional, and Betty got off with a small sum, at least for her. There's bad luck for old women, Stephen said, and went in search of a new cash cow. The ticket to the presentation was lucky, because there he met Mrs. Macduff, handsome, wealthy. In addition, unlike his previous ladies and the same age as the young one fell in love with Smith as a school girl, so without hesitation went with him to the wedding. Surprisingly, when Stephen drove up to the house, the idea of radically getting rid of his unloved wife no longer seemed so terrible to him. Moreover, Smith realized that he had been ready for it when he became infatuated with the young neighbor girl. Or rather, he thought he was carried away by these bourgeois thinking that the whole world is at their feet. But as if it were not so, he thought cheerfully. Besides, Stephen goes for it for love. He is. By the way, the real estate agency that supposedly belonged to him really existed though, belonged to Stephen's friend, which in the event would confirm that he was the owner of the organization or say that they owned the agency in shares. It's a situation where you think she's going to listen to me. With a sigh, Stephen Michelson asked, after listening to a classmate, your friend didn't listen to you, and me misunderstanding. Sadly, said Miranda, but I'm sure if you do some digging, you'll find something on that asshole. You have the opportunity, but I don't. Betty Domnina hired a lawyer, so why don't we start dancing from there? You make a case. John spoke favorably. All right, let's give it a try. The next day, the man got the right people involved, and in record time they gave him the whole story. Stephen Smith was indeed an Alfonso. As for the marriage scam, Adriana Macduff is his second victim so far, a police officer said. And another curious fact, prior to his marriage to Adriana Smith rented an apartment next door to her former stepmother Clara. Actually, the detective learned that he still visits there and, according to neighbors, is in an affair with Vanessa, niece. She lives with her aunt. There seems to be a whole gang of them. The man shook his head in amazement. In one way or another, it is mysterious, nodded the policeman. The aunt and her niece are also prostitutes from time to time. Well, not exactly prostitution, but love for money is a common thing for them. Well, thanks for the information. He thanked John and shook the policeman's hand heartily. The police officer left and Michelson began to think. He remembered how unhappy Adriana had looked when her father had married and how she had changed after his divorce. After all, the former stepmother might start to take revenge on Adriana. John thought and grabbed the phone. Stephen wasted no time either. Adriana had given her husband the right to act on her behalf, but only in emergencies. Well, it would be soon enough, he thought rubbing his hands together. He thought, rubbing his hands together in anticipation of a happy and carefree life. With the woman he loved, and with the help of a smart lawyer, I'm also about the gold. Adriana playfully said Stephen, kissing his wife on the shoulder. 
Let's take a trip somewhere. Oh, I don't know. Adriana shook her head with a sigh. I've got a lot on my plate right now. Yeah, I'm not suggesting it right now, just in a week or two. I've got a lot on my plate right now, and I'm tired as hell. In a week or two? Well, can we? Where shall we go? I'd like to go somewhere in the mountains or a body of water. In general, closer to nature, Stephen answered and hastened to add. But if you want a different place, I'll offer my thoughts. Anything you say, my queen. And you know, the idea of a body of water is not bad. Adriana smiled. But it's too cold to swim. But I'd love to go boating. And I would also like to be at some campground to be in complete solitude. Dreamily said the husband. Just you and me. How do you feel about vacationing in a tent? I've never tried it. But why not try it? What do I mean? In the morning, when Adriana arrived at work, she saw John in the waiting room. Hi, classmate. She said hello cheerfully. I'm here to see you, John. Although it wasn't that obvious. And what brings you to me dazzlingly? Adriana smiled. She looked so happy jealously, thought the admirer. I need to talk to you, said discreetly. Well then, please do. Invited Adriana and added then as hospitable hostess's tea, coffee, juice. No, thank you, declined. Michelson cut to the chase. Adriana, I want to talk to you about your husband, my husband, your husband. Your husband, Stephen, is an Alfonso and a marriage scammer. Aha. Uh -huh. He's also an occasional doping addict. Tell me honestly, did Miranda tip you off? No, not Miranda. John decided not to give away a classmate. Stephen Smith is reportedly connected to shut up. Be honest. You're jealous. You're jealous. But that's not what this is about. John answered honestly and didn't want to hear any nasty things about my husband. Go away. All right, Adriana, I will. Michelson replied with sadness in his voice and handed her a business card. Call me any time of the day or night. Have a good day. And he walked out. Adriana was returning from a business trip, tired but satisfied. She had managed to do her chores early, and now she would surprise her husband by seeing the light in the cottage window. Adriana smiled and thought fondly of her husband. God, I love him so much. In a week's time we will go to the lake. It will be very romantic. Just me and Stephen deciding to put the car in the garage. Later, she took off her shoes on tiptoe and snuck up to the house. From the open living room window came soft music and Stephen's voice. He had no idea about anything. With a grin, Tomas said to him, in love with me like a cat, and doesn't even realize that her days are numbered. We must, we must get rid of her. Stephen sounded like he was drunk. There was a gurgling noise, apparently, the husband was pouring himself his favorite cognac. You know what Hare said? I missed you. My bed is so cold without you in it. Adriana thought grudgingly. There's nothing of yours here at all. And suddenly she was afraid. She doesn't know what he's talking about. She's in love with me like a cat. She doesn't even realize her days are numbered. Adriana remembered her husband's words and sang. It was a terrible thing to realize. Stephen was talking about her. Apparently he was talking to a woman. Her shoes fell out of her hands with a thud, and Adriana picked them up and ran to the car. She stepped on the gas and drove off, only to go to her father's house. Adriana didn't want to upset him. Miranda must be offended, and it was getting late. The young woman stopped at the entrance to the cottage village and reached for her purse. Lucky, and oh, miracle business card was there. John, she exclaimed. John, were you right? Stephen, he's trying to kill me. Robert, where are you right now? Excited, asked by a classmate. At the entrance to the cottage community, are you in a car? Yeah, don't go anywhere. I'll be there in 15 minutes. John arrived by cab. Where are you going now? He asked, having listened humbly for years. I don't know, you can go to the office. You don't have to go to the office. Let's go. Stones, let's go. Let's go. Come on. Let me drive. 
Adriana stayed with John for two days. All the while his men were tapping Stephen's phone and monitoring the house. She apologized to Miranda, and the friend immediately rushed to who may fight with sympathy, she said, hugging Adriana. And it is still unknown who is poor here broke the idol. John's voice broke the idol. While the friends were making up, a classmate was cooking Greek meat. The compromise on the whole group is solid, but more on that later. The meat is ready. So the girls went to dinner. John served the meat with a bottle of marvelous pink wine while he went to get glasses. Miranda whispered to her friend, I look at you and imagine you are Miranda's family. So Miranda thought, okay, nodded Adriana, just be quiet. I'm quiet, I'm quiet. But for a successful return from a business trip, winked Michelson, recalling glasses. The next day, Adriana drove home. When she entered the cottage, her husband was watching television. Looking at his red eyes and slightly puffy face, it was easy to guess that Stephen had been taking a lot on his chest all these days. Oh, hi. Why didn't you call? I would have met you. What were you singing the other day? I missed you. Problem. Stephen. Really? Stephen, I'm not alone. Who am I with? He was confused. Adriana opened the door and Slaga and Vanessa entered, followed by John and three other men. It is nice to see you with a weighty tone, the former stepdaughter said and turned to her rival. Vanessa, is that your name? Have a seat. Let's go next to Stephen. You two seem to have been together. You look good together. So this is how one of the men started out. You Smith, Stephen, are charged with organizing a crime. What crime do you know? The murder of your wife. But I didn't kill anybody. So no one's saying you did. Adriana, as you can see, is alive. It wasn't me who screamed. Stephen pointed at the fox. It was her cultural thing. One of the men said, Stephen received a five-year sentence. His failed accomplices got off with probation. After a while, Vanessa realized she was pregnant and hoped for a retrial. Adriana, I have a chance. John asked her hopefully when she came to his house to pick up some of her forgotten things. There's definitely hope. Adriana smiled. Two years later, after another hard day at work, John, an investigator for the prosecutor's office, drove up to the flower stand to buy large lilac chrysanthemums. Adriana's favorite flowers. And we've been waiting for you, said the chrysanthemum seller with a smile. They're fresh. Well, and wonderfully, he smiled, and having bought an impressive bouquet, hurried home. The day before yesterday, John took the most wonderful baby girl in the world from the hospital with Adriana Katya. It was worth hurrying for that. Hi. He smiled as he handed his wife the flowers. Thank you. Adriana whispered. And Katia just fell asleep. God, girls, you should know how much I love you.